who is who. Amen. Whatever our profession means nothing unless it cooperates with God's knowledge of who we really are. Yes. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ. What is that? That everyone that nameth the name of Christ. What is the name of Christ? Christian. Christian that's right. I'm hoping someone will catch that. Depart from iniquity. If a man therefore purge himself from these, verse 21, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart, and meet for the master's use. And prepared unto every good work. If we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians are going to be a vessel of honor, we must employ three watchwords in our practical living. They are essential. You can't live without them. The first. In Luke 21, 36, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be what? Accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass, and stand before the Son of Man. Amen. <clears throat> watch is the watch word. The first thing, Watch. We must be watching for the way marks of the times in which we are living. We cannot be sticking our heads in the ground, ignoring Bible prophecies that are so quickly being fulfilled this very day. We've discussed this in the last couple of weeks of how laws have been altered the same law that was been passed 49 years in a row. This time, when it was signed, there had an amendment put to it that gave President Obama a liberty to go against the Constitution and literally seize anyone that the government determines to be a hazard to its government. Without trial, without cause, it's fair game. A very clear stepping stone for when we say we will not bow to the dictates of Catholicism and worship on Sunday, we will only worship on Sabbath, we will become a threat to the government. And there, they will have legal ability, legal right to tell the army, go seize this person, go seize that person. We must understand the reality of which we live. The second watchword. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is what? The will of God in what? Christ Jesus concerning who? Us. Every single one of us. It doesn't leave anybody out here. Do we really understand what it means to pray without ceasing? You see, it is imperative that we learn in practical life a life of constant prayer. It is so easy to be distracted by the world's allurements, daily requirement to sustain life. 
that we forget that the real sustainer is Jesus Christ who empowers us daily, moment by moment. Sometimes it's... <coughs> we need to start praying. If we have a job that gets so intense that, that we can't even have God in our mind a moment while we're at work, we need to be asking God, is there something else that we can do? Is there something else that you want me doing? Help me. Open up doors so I can see. I'm praying that for my wife because it's, it's a battle. It's a battle. Number three, the watchword. The third watchword. Work. John 9, 4. I must work the works of who? Yeah. Him that sent me. Who has sent you? Have you sent yourself? Are you on your own agenda? Because if you're on your own agenda, you, are, you cannot be a Christian. You may think you're a Christian. But if you're on your own agenda, you cannot be a Christian. It's impossible. Work while it is day. The night cometh when how many work? No one. This is not talking about physical 24 hours a day where you have sunshine one part of the dime and dark. That's not what it's talking about here. There's going to come a time when it's going to be dark in this world for those desiring righteousness. They're going to want to kill everyone that is upholding the Bible. They're going to want to separate themselves. It's going to be very hard to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. You see, the work is laid out for us as a people. And it is a warfare aggressive charge because Satan knows the time in which he has is very short. He has lost the war. Now this is a very strange paradox. Because here Satan knows he's lost the war, but he's still battling. It doesn't make sense. Normally when two countries or two entities are fighting, one knows they've lost, what happens? They yield, they surrender. But not Satan. It seems like even though he knows he has lost, he is going to do everything he can to make it even harder and battle even harder. Why? Because he's still trying to win the little battles in our individual lives and hearts and minds. We must work steadfastly in harmony with Jesus Christ in leading others to the gospel of salvation. We don't want anyone who we could share our faith with to say, you didn't tell me that? You knew this was going to happen and you didn't say anything? Now that would be embarrassing. True. Now that's like, that's like uh, um, I know that Sister Lorna has, has, has won a, a million dollar lottery ticket and, and, and she didn't know that she won. <laughs> and, and 24 hours after the, the time period had ended that for her to redeem the ticket, I let her know. I said, hey, Lorna, Sister Lorna, did you know that you had the winning ticket? How could you? What did you do with it? You mean I won? And you didn't tell me? Amen. Amen. Now, I know it's a poor and example. But the reality is this. Every single one of us has got salvation paid for us. We just have to accept it. Amen. 
don't tell the others, then they're going to be able to say, you didn't tell me? You didn't live it? You didn't share it? You didn't talk to me? And you knew? It's a hard way to go. Let the whole burden of the soul be to just what Christ was in his work. What was Christ in his work? We are to make no compromise with the habits and practices of the world. We are to stand upon the platform of eternal truth. Amen. Pure, unadulterated truth. Amen. Don't look at things the way man has perverse things. Mm -hmm. Ask God, what is the unadulterated truth? I love the way David Astor was, has been talking on 3ABN in the last few days about the Trinity. And he's made it very clear. Just because XYZ person over here says this is the definition of the Trinity, and this person over here says there's another definition of the Trinity, doesn't mean that I have to believe the Trinity that way. It's just the word. It's not how that person defines it. It's not how that person defines it. How does God define it? Amen. We are very limited in our language. We need to understand that nothing about spiritual things can be fully explained or fully understood we're using human language. We're talking about an eternal God. So let us not get hung up on a word having only one definition. Because every time there is a spiritual concept, every time that there's a spiritual understanding, Satan is going to try to counterfeit the ones that are the most important to God. Amen. Why do you think he has a counterfeit Sabbath? Why do you think he has a counterfeit diet? Why do you think he has... It goes on and on and on. Because Satan is trying to bring you away from thinking about what's God's idea, what's God's definition of this understanding. <coughs> the amount of hatefulness and spitefulness of if you don't see it my way you can't go to heaven attitude is ridiculous and when you start simplifying things down and say okay this is to what the truth is don't look at man's perversions that's what it means to have unadulterated truth Okay? We remove all of man's ideas out of it. What is God's idea? In this we may be considered what? Singular. Singular. Oh, you're just your just out there. Trust me. It's okay. <clears throat> but this is the lot of all who may. Christ, their portion. In other words, when you start looking at truth as unadulterated, nothing perversed by man, you are going to look really odd. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. We're, gonna just, we're building a platform here. Of understanding the concept of being either sealed in truth or sealed in air. Everyone is going to get sealed. Work out your what? Brother's salvation. Your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh what? In you. In you. 
your own life to will and to do His good pleasure. That's why I've said time and time again, no man, no woman can argue with your own personal experience. The problem is, is we don't express ourselves in that testimony. We try to work out our brother's salvation or our sister's salvation and we don't concentrate on our own salvation. Now. What did I say? Now. Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never Sounds absolute there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. there, is there any room for error here? Is there any room for ambiguities? No. It is clear. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious world-loving man or woman. What does it mean to be ambitious, world-loving man or woman? What does that mean? Trying to gain everything the world has to offer. And it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. It could be in sports. It could be in, in your job. It's our duty to do the best we possibly can in our work if that gives us a promotion we have to ask, God, will I be able to glorify your name in that promotion or should I stay at the level I'm at? Not all the time should we accept the promotion when it comes our way. we got to ask, God, do you really want me to have that promotion? Am I going to be able to glorify you in that promotion? Because if I can't, I better not take it. Did we ever think about that? That's what it means to, to not have that ambition of world. Because if we can't serve Christ to our utmost in a position that of a, a, a in, in our job that creates more responsibility so we have less time for Him, we better take a less position. It will never. Do you, I, you get a theme here? <laughs> God will never. It will never. There again. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. Another absolute. Another Don't try to get around these absolute statements. It's not healthy for you spiritually. All who receive the seal of God must be without spot before God. Candidates for heaven. Go forward, my brothers and sisters. I can only write briefly upon these points at this time. Merely calling your attention to the necessity of what? Preparation. Preparation. Search the scriptures for yourself that ye understand the fearful solemnity of this present hour. What hour are we living in? We're living in the last minutes of the last hour. I, I really believe that we've been in overtime for a long time. I really do. I can remember some things transpired in 1970 and 72 and I heard, I was listening to my parents as a child and, and I said, why should I even consider worrying about going to college. I'm not going to even have a chance to even get married the way things are going. 
And now I'm a grandfather. <laughs> so we need to understand that no matter how bad, no matter how the signs look right now, the way things are set up, that doesn't mean it's going to happen now. And if it doesn't happen, we better fall on our knees and ask God to forgive us for not being one with Him. Because that's what He's waiting for. He is not waiting for this world to get any worse. We're already trying to create humans out of whatever. Trust me, we are no better now than we on this earth than when God destroyed the earth with a flood. And the sin of amalgamation, the sin of amalgamation is what God caused God to destroy this earth with flood. At that particular time, there was no barrier between man and beast. And men were, and women were having sex with animals and creating all kinds of things. Animals and were being crossbred and all kinds of things. Why do you think we had the dinosaurs? The dinosaurs were created by the perversion of man. God did not create a dinosaur. The perversions of man. Remember. God put on the ark the things He created and destroyed all of man's sin. Let's understand truth when it's truth. If God had created a dinosaur, He'd have put it on the ark. Amen. Not one of us. I've started out this sermon with some absolutes so we can understand this foundation cannot be adjusted. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have how much? One spot or stain upon them. This next aspect we had better understand. It is left with who? Us. Us to remedy the defects in our characters. Now let's stop right there for a minute. <coughs> I thought that Jesus took care of our sins and washed them all away. And he does all the work for us. So that's what we were studying in the Sabbath school lesson, right? Is this a contradiction of what we were learning in Sabbath school? It sounds like it, doesn't it? But is it? We need to understand this. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters. What is that saying? I cannot rely on Glennis for the perfection of my life. You cannot rely on your pastor to understand and apply into your life the unadulterated truth and surrender to Christ. Only you can do that. That's why we read, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It is left to you and your God to get it together. You cannot rely on me. You cannot rely on a spouse. You can't rely on a parent or a child. It has to be you and God and you and God alone. Because God does not have any grandchildren. Amen. He doesn't have any in-laws or outlaws. <laughs> it is just you and God. And that is it. We've got to get it together to understand it. Just like Tim was teaching, we have to surrender to God ourselves. That's what it means. 
when we are remedying the defects in our character, we are going to God and saying, God, I recognize I have a problem with anger. I have a recognize I have a problem with lying. Whatever the case may be, and say, Lord, I need that victory that you won for me at the cross. And claim it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Apply it into your life. That's what it means to remedy the effects of sin in your life. To cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. You've got to get personal with your God. Amen. Because if you don't get personal with your God, you will be lost. Salvation is like a marriage. If you do not get intimate with your spouse, you're going to end up in divorce. And Christ has went through a divorce with the children of Israel. And He has said, I will have a new Israel, and that is you and I. But He will not marry you unless you are one with Him. Amen. There's a wedding feast to attend. Are you going to be part of it? Or are you going to be left out? There's no middle ground. Then. Now when you have a them in the middle of a paragraph, what is that telling you? So that it to happen. That you better understand what the first half of the paragraph said because the then doesn't mean anything until the first half is taken care of. Once the sin has, and the defects of your character has been dealt with and your soul has been cleansed, then the latter rain will what? Fall. fall on us. Please, don't pray for the latter rain to fall on you while you're still in sin. Because it will confirm you in sin. And then you're damned to hell. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples in the day of Pentecost. We better understand. We cannot have the latter rain fall on us while we're still dealing with the defects of our character. Yeah. Just as soon. This is one of the most important paragraphs of this sermon. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in this concept. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen. But a what? Settling into the truth. Both intellectually and spiritually. So they, who's the they? People the people of God cannot be moved. Now, I'm going to stop right there. The whole purpose of this series that we are doing, that's going to be 10, 12 sermons long, <coughs> is to <coughs> excuse me, is to understand this concept of being settled into the truth. Notice, the seal of God is not a mark. It is a settling into the truth. Amen. So you cannot be moved. Amen. So if you are not Settle in the truth. If you do not understand what it means to be settled in the truth, if you are not settled in the truth correctly, and you get an uh, experience that is not God, you're going to be sealed in air and not truth, and you're damned to hell. You see? But if you are settled into the truth of God that is unadulterated, that is only God and not perverse by man, 
then you will have the seal of God because it is God's truth that you are settled into. Amen. Does it make sense? Yes. It is imperative that we understand this. And we are going to unpack this for at least 10 or 12 weeks. Because it is going to be extremely important for us to understand the intimacy of all this truth. How it is interlinked and interwoven together. And if you affect one, you've affected them all. And the settling of the truth is literally understanding how they all relate to each other. Just in the doctrine of the Trinity, which is a God-ordained doctrine. Amen. When it is defined correctly. The problem is man has perversed it over here. He's perversed it over here. Through the power of Satan. But God still has his truth about the Trinity. Do we understand that? Because if we don't understand it from God's point of view, it affects the everlasting covenant of Christ being slain before the foundation of the world. It affects everything of the gospel. It affects the nature of Christ. It affects being born again. All of these doctrines are affected if we don't believe in the Trinity. We can't even have salvation if we reject the Trinity. From God's point of view. Because if we reject the Holy Spirit as a person, as an entity that is directly responsible to help us in our salvation, if we reject it, how can we be saved? It is the only link we have to heaven. Going on. Just as soon as God's people are sealed, and prepare for the shaking. It will come. Indeed, it has already begun. This was written a long time ago. You see, we've been having these shakings and these, these buffetings of the church and his people regularly. And God is saying, are you going to submit to me and go all the way? Or do I got to wait for another generation? God help us if he has to wait for another generation. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. Next few these next few paragraphs these next these next few paragraphs are from a book it's a little known manuscript by Julius Gilbert White called the Alpha and Omega of Apostasy it's also in the Christian's Experience book and this is about the ceiling and he gets into a little bit more detail there is an important feature of the sealing work which is not usually explained. After an individual has been sealed by God, he does not change. This is not entirely an edict of God. What is an edict? A pronunciation, a proclaim, proclaiming. This is not all about God now. Okay? God has a role to play. But it's not just him saying, okay, I put my stamp on you, you can't change. That's not what it's about, totally. It's not entirely an edict of God which forbids his changing. But this individual has had something in his own experience which confirmed him, fixed him, established him, and settled him. Did we get that? 
confirmed him, fixed him, established him, settled him. Four steps. Did we get that? Settled him for how long? Forever. Forever. In the thing he has espoused. Those who espouse the full blaze of the gospel light shining upon the remnant church will be confirmed or sealed in it. Then he asked the question, how is it done? The truth is to impart an experience to each receiver. But it is not enough that the receiver have the right experience. He must know that that experience is what? Right. right. This is a most vital point. He must be convinced beyond all controversy that it is right. He must become so sure of it that he will not, he will stand to it, though what? The heavens fall. And trust me, they are going to fall all around you. Amen. Sister White makes a comment. She says, all earthly support will be removed. It's true. In other words, your reverse mortgage will not be there if they will fall back on it. Your Social Security will not be able to fall back on it. You will have nothing. You will have nothing to hold on to. You will walk in, and because you're in the state of Florida, your job is only secure as you walk in and the employer says you can still work here. The employer in the state of Florida does not need to give you any notice. Zero. You can walk in thinking you are going to work and they give you a box and say you're done. No trial no investigation, you're done. Alright? All earthly support. What else does that mean? That means you cannot rely on your spouse or your parent for salvation or support either. Because you don't know what's going on in the other person's mind. All you see is the outward. We gotta pour our hearts out to God for each other. For each one of us that we are faithful and true. Amen. Amen. But let it be noted at this point. It is just as possible and easy to be sealed in air as it is in the same principle, identical principle, still applies. Everybody's going to get sealed. Everybody! You're either going to be sealed in truth or sealed in air. Yes, sir. And it's just as easy to be sealed in air as it is in truth. And we need to understand this. Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials. And a great portion of those who now appear what? Genuine. Genuine and true will prove as base metal. What is base metal? It's worthless junk. It's trash. It's unreliable. It has no strength. No value. You can't even make a tin can with it. Do we understand what that means? 
to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. If you think as Seventh-day Adventist, your test is a Sabbath, you just fail. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A mercy, Lord. It was. Yes, you get this? In other words, you can come to church on Sabbath every week and still be sealed in air. Yes, true. True. Amen. So true. Because if you don't have the experience that the Holy Spirit is trying to get in your life, and you think that just because you are coming to church on Sabbath, everything is okay, you are all wrong. True. You must be willing to stand up and say, this is truth, and where I am going is truth, and this is where you need to be too. Yes, sir. And, not be, and not be afraid to allow your reputations and your lives to be scorned because you've made a decision. It's not about you, it's about God. Amen. And if we aren't standing up for God now, He's not going to stand up for us. Amen. The self-preservation habits that we've gotten into have got to be gone. At this time, we must gather warmth from what? Coldness. The coldness of others. Courage from their cowardness and loyalty from their treason. Did you get that? The closest ones to us, the closest ones to us will literally treason against us. Because of their lack of courage, because of their cowardness. The nation will be on the side of what? Satan. The great rebel leader. Yes, sir. Satan himself. Yes, sir. You see, the fiery trials can never overcome us if we are willing to meet the requirements of God. We cannot be overcome. Now, if we stop there, that would give us license to do just about anything. <laughs> you understand? We've got to read the whole paragraph. But I'm stopping right there for a reason. This is a promise that we need to ingrain in our minds. Amen. We cannot be overcome. Why? We plays our what? Whole, complete, entire dependence upon God and stand firm in what? His, His strength. Know what we believe, why we believe it, and stand firm on it. Praise the Lord. Amen. When we are tempted, we must humble ourselves. We must keep back the words of argument with which we think we could battle or baffle the enemy. When you get personally attacked for what you say, sometimes it's better to say nothing. Amen. Let the argument die by saying nothing. Because you know where you stand and being attacked by why you stand there is only of Satan. I don't make apologies for what I say in this pulpit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If I did that, I would be violating the very essence of the Holy Spirit teaching us, not just you, but me, of what the truth is. It's not about what somebody else defined anything. It's about what God has defined for us. Amen. What we desire to say might be perfectly true. 
But God does not wish his people to controvert Satan's suggestions. We aren't to be debating these people. They can use all the scripture they want to twist their theology around to whatever they want to believe. But it's not for us to fool with. Let them take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. Let their we only weapon be the word. It is written. Yes, sir. This will bring more confusion to him than any charge we that ourselves could make against him. He has used the word of God frequently to heavenly assemblies. God's word sh stand fast forever. They cannot be changed. Amen. Paul makes it very clear. One of the most dangerous prophecies, warnings ever in the Bible. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 13. For the mystery of iniquity doth what? Already work. Already work. In Paul's day, the mystery of iniquity was well on its way. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Who's the he? No. Let's read it again. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. There's two he's. Who's the first he? God. Thank you. Let's identify. There's two different he's here. Don't make the same he, don't make he both both he's the same. Because it can't be. God allows it until Satan be what? Taken away. Alright? Now, let's go to the next verse. And then shall the wicked be what? Revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of what? His mouth, not mine, not yours, his mouth, and shall destroy with what? Brightness, Brightness of who's coming? Christ. The Lord, Jesus Christ. That's who the Lord is, Jesus Christ. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. All right now, who's that him? Antichrist. All right, the Antichrist. All right. Now, and with all the sinfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because what? They receive not. They receive not the love of what? The truth. Now we're going to stop right there. Do you see why it's imperative that we are settled into the truth of God? Amen. The only way you're going to get settled in the truth of God is if you love the truth more than this world. <clears throat> it's the only way. The things of this world must be Always be secondary to the truths that God is trying to teach us individually and collectively. Amen. Because they received not the love of the truth. What is the love of the truth? Excuse me? Jesus Christ. 
that they might be saved. All right? Because they did not receive Jesus Christ, the truth, because they did not receive the love that all-encompassing power of Christ living in them, that they might be saved. Get what happens next. It's important. For this cause. What cause? Come on. What cause? Because they didn't love the truth. Because they didn't love the truth. For this cause. Because they didn't love the truth. God shall send them what? Strong delusions that they believe a lie. Because they didn't have the love of truth. Because of that, now God sends them a strong delusion to believe a lie that they think is truth. Yeah. That's right. This is why it's imperative that we understand and know what we believe is truth unadulterated. Because if it is not unadulterated truth, we are believing a lie and thinking it's truth. Amen. Do you see how serious it is? We are going to get sealed one way or the other, in truth or in error. And we better understand, it's either unadulterated truth or it's a lie that we think is truth. That they, who's the they? Those who are, Those who are in this delusion. That they might be damned who believe not what? The truth. The truth. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, if you're always looking for the devil behind the bush, you're going to find him. And God's going to let you find him all you want. If that's what you're seeking after. If you're seeking after man's perversions, you're never going to understand the truth. It is only when we are seeking only for truth and not worried about how man has perversed it, but looking, okay, what is the truth? In God only am I looking. That's the only way. You do not understand what a, what a real $100 bill looks like by understanding every single counterfeit. And how they make those counterfeits. That's not what they train people. They train them in the original. The true. We need to stop worrying about man's perversion. And stick only to the unadulterated truth. Right. How can we know the truth? We're going to go through it for about 12 weeks. But in short, it is the Word of God, unadulterated, lived out in our lives. We must surrender to it totally and completely. We cannot have pleasure in unrighteousness. But they are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from what? Beginning. From what beginning? Before the foundation of the world, God hath chosen you from the beginning to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. reality is our warfare will be aggressive. The issues are tremendous. Right upon us. And we must work in harmony with God in our prayers. Let nothing Lessen the force of truth for this time. Present truth must be our burden. Amen. That is why we have the sermons that we have. That is why we have the Sabbath school lessons. We're not here to be here for another 50 years. 
Okay? The His Vine Free Seventh-day Adventist Church does not have an agenda to be here for another 50 years. Okay? We want to go home. And every Sabbath service, every Tuesday evening service is designed by God to bring this work in our lives to an end so we can receive the seal of God and be settled in the truth and go home. Amen. Amen. I want to go home. Amen. And home is not on Goodman Avenue. Amen. Amen. The third angel's message must do its work of separating from the churches a people that will take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. Amen. Uh, Amen. Don't be afraid when there's a separation. Because that's the work of the third angel's message. All should be intelligent in the regard to the agency by which the soul is destroyed. It is not because of any decree that God has sent out against man. He does not make a man spiritually blind. That's important. We better understand that God isn't the one that destroys us. He just carries out our requests. God does not make a man or woman spiritually blind. God gives sufficient light and evidence to enable man to distinguish truth from error. He does not force men to receive truth. Amen. Never once has he ever forced a person to accept truth. He leaves him to free to choose good or to choose evil. It's your choice. It's my choice. If man resists the evidence that is sufficient to guide his judgment in the right direction and chooses the evil one, once he will do no more readily than the second time. And the third time will be still more eager to withdraw himself from God and choose to stand on the side of Satan. You see, you choose him once. God's over here. Okay? And we can stand right next to God. And when we choose evil, we take one step over here. Now the same issue comes up again. God brings the same issue again. If we choose evil, we've taken another step. Now he's going to bring it again. He's not going to give you new issues to deal with. He's going to give you the same issue again. The choice is, are you going to turn and go this way? Or are you going to come back toward him? The problem is, it's much easier to... To go farther and farther away until you are no longer even reachable by the Holy Spirit. That's serious. It's serious. Because when you start getting to that point, you start calling light darkness and darkness light. And in this course, he will continue until he is confirmed in evil, believes the lie he has cherished as truth. His resistance has produced its harvest. By his example, he leads others to follow in the same course of resistance against God. We better make sure we know where we stand and that we are standing up for Christ and not self and Satan. We've got to ask ourselves, am I standing up for God? Because if I'm not standing up for God, I'm standing up for Satan. That's right. 
We should be trembling for our youth today. With all the video games and, and PlayStation this and I mean all the stuff that's going on. Some of it is actually pretty good. There's one that's connect that Microsoft has brought out now where you don't even have to have a, a control. Your body is the controller. And, and, and they have got some of these things now where they have workout routines that are actually good. Okay? But trust me, there's a whole lot more bad than good and don't waste your money. Just do walk outside or go to the gym or something. You'd be much better off. But the reality is Satan has perversed everything. And when you're looking at a box intently on playing this game, there is no way your mind can be controlled by anything but that what's that what you're doing. And that is demonic. It is demonic. When you can play a game for eight hours and not even realize eight hours has gone by, that's demonic. Just the opposite is true. When you can spend eight hours in church and not realize it's eight hours, that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And which would you rather have? A spiritual experience with God or with a box? <laughs> we be, we're tre we tremble before the Lord of how Christians today have given examples to our youth these parents who have professed Christianity that are not living up to what they profess are actually driving their youth away from God. It is never ceases to amaze me to realize how many of the men and women that I went to school with and graduated high school academy in 1976, how many of them are either agnostic, not even really Christian at all, or so liberal in Adventism that it's okay to drink, it's okay to have this, it's okay to do this, it doesn't matter. You're going to heaven anyway. The, the statistics now is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of over 50% of Adventists drink wine and say there's nothing wrong with it. And they're going to hell. Social drinking is one of the major problems in our, in our ranks. And God says, touch not. When our children see no victories in their parents, no victories in their teachers, no victories in their pastors, they see only misery and double standards. And the world is brought into the church under the guise of glorifying God. And so we have church socials and church plays and church cultural false festivals. And all these inconsistencies bring, sanctioned by the Seventh-day Adventist Christians, influence our youth to be lovers of pleasure instead of lovers of God. And will bear record against those who are responsible in the judgment. We need to realize what we're doing and foster in our children the desire for the Bible and for the spirit of prophecy and to desire the spiritual things of life and not the world things. I'm so thankful to my mother who when she could not even buy food, she saved dollars pennies and on my when I turned 10 my brother was 8 we got one thing for Christmas that year only one the box the present under the tree was just a small box <clears throat> And mom said, this is for you three children. 
It took everything she could to buy that little box. And inside that box was 75 records called My Bible and Living Sound. From Genesis through Acts. In narration, story, which actually they took patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, desire of ages, acts of the apostles, and put them in children's form so that children could understand the Bible at their level. And us children wore those records out. By the time we left home, three quarters of those records could not play on any record player. It was just too scratched up and too worn out. But I thank God that I had a mother that was willing to sacrifice even herself to buy clothes for herself that she needed. Praise the Lord. Because she recognized as a single mother, she had only one chance to ingrain into her children the reality of the scriptures because she had no husband to do it. And we need to seek after that of how to ingrain in our children what it means. And even though none of us here have real young children, we have children who now have children. I know, Tristan, you don't yet. At least not that I know of. I'm just kidding. The reality is we've got to understand we have a responsibility to figure out a way to help our young people train their, their babies. About a year ago, I was conversing with a young lady who was just showing that she was pregnant. And I started to explain to her that she needed to start talking to her child even now, when it's in the womb. And then not to play the rock and roll music, and to what, be careful what you drink and what you eat, because it affects the growth of that baby. Sure. She says, really? I didn't know that. No doctor told me that. Sure. I said, doctors don't know everything. I said, trust me. My firstborn child knew my voice. When that child came out in the first five minutes, when, he, when she heard my voice, she looked into my eyes because she heard my voice for months. It is a reality. It's no wonder that the child loves history because my ex-wife read history books front to back because she was taking a history class. And she would sit there and read to the child hours at a time. These things are real. It's what we implant in our children, what we plant in our own personal lives. Why do you think we have the CDs? When you're going down the road, which is better, to listen to the Desire of Ages or to whatever station? I don't know what you listen to. Listening to the life of Christ while you're, while you're driving down the road is so much better than listening to anything else that that radio will ever produce. 
And if you want the Bible on CD, I'll put that on there for you. Anything is better than what that radio will bring out. It is Satan's study plan to clothe sin in garments of light, to hide its deformity, to make it attractive. Ministers and people professing righteousness unite with the adversary of souls to help him in his plans. Never was a time when every church member of the, uh, every member of the church should feel his responsibility to walk humbly and circumspectly, circumspectly before God and right now. We need not trust in people. Jeremiah 17 5 is clear. Thus saith the Lord, cursed, what? Yeah, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Those who would follow Christ must be grounded on the principles of truth. They must be grounded. We need to understand what the Bible teaches in regard to faith and the sanctification through the truth. They must be so established in this knowledge that they cannot be moved. To take false positions on doctrines of holiness will be able to illustrate in their lives the practical workings of this heaven-given principles. The people of God must, there it goes again, must be able to distinguish between the genuine and the spirits. That's why we're going to take the time we're going to be taking to give you a chance to understand. And Sister Sandra says, don't go too fast. I need to get that while I miss. <laughs> She'll want to wait until this afternoon. She wants to know right now. That's okay. Isaiah 58, 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build up, build the waste, old waste places, and shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called what? The repair of the breach. Going back to this again, just a little bit. The time has come when things must be called by what? Their right names. The truth is to triumph gloriously. Amen. And those who have long been halting between two opinions must take their stand decidedly. Amen. For or against yes. the law of God. <clears throat> Some will take up theories that misinterpret the word of God and undermine the foundation of truth that has been what? Firmly, Firmly established. established. Point by point. Sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is why we are taking 12 weeks or at least 10 weeks on this subject. Amen. We are just laying the foundation of what it, the reality that we can either be sealed in air or sealed in truth. We have to understand what that truth is. And here it says again, firmly established, what does it say? Point by point. By point. Sealed by the what? Power of the Holy Spirit. The old truths 
our to be revived in order that what the false theories that may that have been what brought in by the enemy may be intelligently met <coughs> why there can be no unity between truth and error. This is why you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Because when you are grounded on the unadulterated truth, you are going to stick out. Because there's so much. You're either going to be right with God or right with everybody else. And I would rather be right with God and be the only one standing than right with the world. And have my closest friends agree with me. We can unite with those who have been led into deception only when what? They are converted. They are converted. This is in a devotional book called Upward Look, page 88. It is the only place in the spirit of prophecy where this is at. There is no other place in the entire her writings that they put this quotation. It's from a manuscript. They didn't even acknowledge the manuscript. It is in this book and this book only. It's very interesting. Jeremiah 6.16 A reiterating of what we just read. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? Walk therein, that ye may find rest for your soul. Are you weary today? There's some of us that are really weary. Physically, mentally, emotionally. God says you can have rest in me. But they said, we will not walk therein. Are we going to be that stubborn? Or are we going to say, Lord, you teach me. I don't know anything the way I should. As a people, we are to stand firm on the platform of eternal truth that has withstood the test and the trial. We are to hold sure to the pillars of our faith, the principles of truth that God has revealed to us are only true foundation. They have been, they have made us what? We are. The last sentence is extremely important. I got an email just this week about Seventh-day Adventists that are now starting to reject the prophecies because they said Christ could not be coming soon because and all the prophecies of the of the of the great earthquake and the falling of the stars and all this stuff cannot be applied to say that the end time is near because it's been over 200 years since that's happened. And Ellen White, by the power of inspiration by God Himself, says, the lapse of time had not lessened their value. Yes, sir. Amen. We better stand on what God establishes that and never question it. Yes. We shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. God does not want us to be ashamed for what we believe. We are Seventh Day Adventists, and the name and this name, we shall never be ashamed. As a people, we must take a firm stand on truth and righteousness. Amen. We shall glorify God in this. We shall, and we are to live, be delivered from all dangers, not ensnared and corrupted by them. That this 
may be that we must look ever to Jesus, our author and our finisher of our faith. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. Praise the, Lord. the warfare against the agents of Satan are intensifying and we must press together. We must have a complete victory in Christ. He will finish the work in us and through us if we shall unreservedly surrender everything to His victorious control. May God help us to do that surrendering today. Amen.